actually going to talk a little bit about how we should regulate toward interoperability with electronic medical records. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what the problem is. What problem are we trying to solve here? Uh, why, what approaches we are currently using which are not working? Let's go to the root causes of the problem and then start recommending solutions from the root causes. And then why I think that will work. And, uh, and then say, you know, what we should do next. So patients are falling through the cracks but nobody knows. That was our analysis. Lots of things happen. People don't get appointments, nobody knows. If you don't get a lab test done, nobody knows, although that's a, re a regulatory requirement. If you don't fill your medications, nobody knows. If you don't get a specialist appointment, nobody knows. If questions go unanswered, nobody knows, and so that leads to what? Patients going to emergency departments, patients not getting appropriate treatment, undiagnosed conditions, untreated diseases, patients' questions are unanswered, which leads to preventable disease and extra costs. Okay, so in 2019, 61,409, that's it, 61,000 patients, which is like a fraction of the Canadian, of, of the Ontario population. A minor fraction of the patient population drove $715 million worth of costs, which is uh, approximately $11,643.24 per patient. That's huge, okay? And so, um, and by the way, these are just the preventable diseases with known technology and known capabilities. Did that have to happen? No, but you can see that we did do a good job on the two or three million people who also have the same disease and did not get these complications. So in fact, it's just a very small number, but those small numbers drive a lot of cost because care these days is expensive. And what we need to be able to do is track down a very small percentage of people. Okay? And that's, they're falling through the cracks. So the current proposed solution is let's have interoperability, right? Everybody wants interoperability, so let's pretend. What happens when interoperability works? What happens when interoperability works? When we have everything, everywhere, all at once. What do you think? What's going to happen? What happens to the humans when you give them lots and lots of data? Yes, information overload. So my question to you is, if a lot is too much, but nothing is too little, what's the middle ground? And so what we're going to do is we're going to find the Goldilocks solution. This is neither too much nor too little, but just enough. So to get that, what we did was we said, interoperability must provide, at minimum, three benefits. Those are, it must improve patient safety, i.e. patients should not be falling through the cracks, thank you very much. It should enable compliance with regulations. And it should reduce the cognitive load and increase observa observability and traceability of transactions in our healthcare system. That's it, those three things. Because if we have observability, then people don't fall through the cracks. So here's what happens when in the current situation, patient calls the clinic, can't get through. They wait, they get sicker, or they get through but they can't find an appointment in a timely manner. So they go to the ER. A doctor orders a test or prescribes a medication. Patient doesn't get it done. Patient doesn't take the medication. That leads to complications. And there's lots of messages going back and forth and multiple channels between doctors and patients, okay? 
So what falls through the cracks stays in the cracks, out of sight, out of mind. So this is what interoperability should provide. Observa observability and traceability. No patient should ever get lost when booking an appointment. No one should have to skip a lab or diagnostic imaging test because they lost their requisition. They shouldn't take, miss their meds because they didn't get it from the pharmacy. And they shouldn't miss their specialist appointment or have their questions go unanswered because when questions go unanswered, what happens? You're not gonna take your meds. You're not gonna follow the treatment. So all of these need to be in place. How do we do it? Jonathan Marcus talked, talked to us about a jurisdictional scheduler. We need that because that's how you make sure that patients don't fall through the cracks when booking an appointment. Every lab requisition should be sent digitally with an, with a identifier so that the results can be matched back to the original order. How many times do doctors say, oh, did you get the lab test done? I don't know. I can't trace it. I have no idea where it is in the system. I can't, it's not matched because there's no matching. When there's no matching, they get duplicate results, triplicate results. It drives them crazy because there's no way that they can match it when the machine should be matching it, for God's sake. Every prescription should be sent digitally with an identifier so that you can actually track it and see, was it dispensed? Was it picked up? We designed that 25 years ago, Brent. It's not here yet. Let's get it done. Every referral should be sent digitally with an identifier. And patients should be able to book the time of their own choosing using the jurisdictional scheduler. The referral, right now we have a very small number of vendors. That shouldn't be a small number of vendors. It should be a standardized integration and then let the vendors decide who they want to serve and which doctors, which, and doctors should be able to choose which vendor they want to work with. Right now, you have very little choice here. Every communication with a high-risk individual, okay, should be resolved. And that requires some artificial intelligence or some sort of decision support so that doctors can identify the highest risk messages because I can assure you that the number of messages is through the roof. Not everyone's gonna ever get fulfilled. So observability and traceability are keys to patient safety and compliance with regulation, okay? Oops, sorry. And the tools and techniques already exist. They exist in other sectors. Can we just bring them over here instead of trying to reinvent our, the wheels? This is healthcare. We don't need to be, we're, we're not technicians. We don't need to solve those issues. Other people have solved them. Let's bring them here. And much of what I'm talking about actually already exists, but it's a marketplace issue there's no economies of scale, so they are costly because every vendor has to acquire a customer. Well, I don't know whether any of you know, but the co cost of customer acquisition in this industry is close to $5,000 per doctor. Okay? It's expensive. It's very expensive. Well, that cost does not get absorbed by the vendor. They can't absorb costs. It has to be absorbed by the customer. And the customer can't absorb the costs either. And the Ministry of Health, whose mother, who's the mother, right, buying stuff for everybody, can't afford it either. So can we find a way to re reduce customer acquisition costs? Okay, and regulation is one way that we do that. And so I think uh, what I'm proposing here is that regulation provides us the following benefits. We get one standard approach, which, which is basically the basis of interoperability. You need a standard approach. By regulating, you disseminate across the system faster than market forces do. Everyone benefits, vendors, providers, government, and patients. There are no lock-ins. Okay, if you have a standard approach, 
you let the market, the vendors compete on functionality because they can't compete on data quality and data integration and they can't lock it down because they don't own the data structure, then patients can benefit quickly. Okay. So I think there's a lot of benefits to regulation if done correctly. The key is that we should be doing transaction data, interoperate transaction data. Now I understand everybody wants to integrate and interoperate clinical data because they think, oh, the doctor needs to know everything. But you, you can see that they quickly get overwhelmed. As I ask my students, I always ask them one question. I say, you know, when a doctor orders 100 labs, when a doctor orders 100 labs, how many of them are positive? 10%, 90%, or 50%? The answer is 10%. 90% is negative. We're really a healthy, we're a healthy population in Canada. 90% is negative. So every time you interoperate stuff, you're interoperating noise. So let's get to the signal, okay? So when we, trans when we only transact transactions and say the transaction was complete, it was normal or abnormal, then you start to get to a point where, yes, I'm not worrying about that low level stuff, I can worry about the higher level stuff. And doctors in this current interoperability regime worry a lot about the lower end stuff, not the higher end stuff. And in fact, transaction data lowers the cognitive effect precisely because they're not worrying whatever, what happened to that test. They know exactly what's happened to the test because they can track it down. So I would think if, uh, if we follow this approach, then I think we can go from chaotically connected, which is what we are right now, uh, and you know, to answer somebody's question around uh, Clinical Care Connect. Um, that's too much data. If you bring all of that data in, it's just gonna overwhelm people, right? So that's what I call chaotically connected. And we need to go to appropriately highly connected. And I think we should focus on transactions of those five things. Thank you very much. Thank you.